Hello, my name is Teresa Valente. I work in Investors Portugal, that is a partner of the project Women and Money, uh, that is promoted by um, by Italian partner Euro Team, that is here with Luisa also. So this workshop is uh, under a series of uh, several workshops in blended mode. Uh, or only online, if it's not possible to put uh, in presential mode, that uh, wants to address women that are interested in put their future professional steps uh, and to increase their knowledge about financial. Um, this project um, the, is to as um, the main aim is to transform women enterprises from a fragile to resilient and uh, anti-fragile capable of having an entrepreneurial approach and financial resource that enable these women to adapt to the difficulties to make diversification plans and overcome a crisis, okay? So today we have here with us uh, Pedro Cerdeira, that is a, a consultant, a business angel, a member of the board of Investors Portugal. So I will let you with uh, Pedro Cerdeira because I think that will be much more interesting than my short presentation. In the chat, there are uh, lots of information about this workshop, also the website of the project where we can go and see more information about the workshops that will be in the next months. Okay, also the workshops from in Portugal, the international workshops and workshops in Italy. So you can be uh, go to the website and make a registration to all these workshops. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you all participants to be here. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, so first of all, let me address one question that popped up in uh, in the chat, which is why don't we do it in Portuguese? Uh, well, there's there's two reasons for that. Um, the first one being that we have uh, some people on on the, the webinar that do not speak Portuguese. The other one being that uh, our intention is to record this session and to make the content available for whoever wants to look at it. Uh, so in that sense, it's a lot easier to do it in English than, than in Portuguese. Um, albeit, uh, there's not an incredible amount of people. Uh, so feel free to make this interactive as you wanted to, to make it. Otherwise, you're just going to listen to me for about an hour, which serves you well. <laughs> Meaning that if you want to get bored, that's the right way to go. If you don't, then please participate, uh, which is a lot nicer. Uh, feel free to turn on uh, your cameras or leave them off, whichever way you want. Uh, participate uh, on the chat, just uh, unmute yourselves, ask the questions. Uh, that's that's the idea. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me move on. So what, what I'm going to address here, uh, it's something, it's a little bit of the core uh, of um, a content that I've already uh, prepared some time ago in the past, and we call it entrepreneurial finance. Um, so what, what is it in a nutshell? It's a sort of a few highlights, if you will, of what is entrepreneurial finance and uh, sort of try to demystify uh, what all of this uh, excels that are referred, are commonly referred to as business plans mean. Uh, they're not incredibly difficult. They can be a very nice tool for you uh, to put together your business and to understand uh, if it is a business indeed, and to make sure that your assumptions are correct. And that's very, very helpful if, for example, you want to raise money and you want to convince investors uh, of, uh, that you really have a business in, uh, in your hand. Um, so this is what we're going to do today uh, very quickly. And this is actually uh a real life example from a project that i've been involved with about oof, maybe seven years ago uh something like that and these are real numbers i will not tell you what the project was uh out of confidentiality but the numbers that you're going to see are real numbers and the comments that i'm going to make are the comments that we ended up uh reaching at the end and the conclusions that we ended up withdrawing at the end um which sort of 
made or break the thing and gave us enough insight in terms of validating ourselves to this, the business plan and then running uh, with it. So this this is what you have in stock. Agenda, a couple of preliminary questions uh, that I would like to discuss. Then I will show you the famous Excel. Please make sure that you have your glasses uh, on hand uh, so that you can have a look at, uh, at the numbers. Um, the third point, it's actually uh, something that investors want to see. The, most investors do not want to see the Excel just because. They want to see the Excel as a result of you having done your homework, meaning that you also understand what, what the business is and if there's a profit in there or not. Uh, and that's that sort of little demonstration that, yeah, I've done my homework, so uh, I come here to show you. Uh, and this is obviously de debatable. Uh, some of the assumptions, if not all of the assumptions, are very debatable. Uh, nobody has a crystal ball that will tell you what the future is for sure. Uh, but then at the end of the day, you need to rely on something and you need to project on top of, uh, of something. So that's as good as anything. And at least it shows that you have thought about it, which uh, I would dare to say it's the most important thing that uh, you could do. Also, in terms of resilience, I mean, this is going to go wrong. Don't 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 get me wrong. Your business is not going to go as planned. No business goes as planned. So, in that sense, if you have the ability of quickly analyzing the situation, snapping back out of it and finding the right solutions, that's what really matters to you, to the business, and for the people that have given you money to, to put in there. And then uh, we'll have a little bit of Q&A uh, at the end. So this is the journey that uh, I'm, uh, I'm proposing uh, to you uh, for us to take together today. So at the end of the day, entrepreneurial finance is nothing more than common sense. Uh, together with a couple of general cultural culture questions I, I, I would dare to say so the first one is why do you need the money okay so you want money to start a new business let's let's go through the first step which is obviously yeah you have decided that, that you want to have a business uh, but now you need money uh, in order to get the, the business running it's obvious if not, otherwise, there would be other people that would be doing the business instead of you. Uh, but do you really want to understand what is the reason why you need the money? Okay. Um, most of the relationship that we have, all of us have with money is determined at a very young age. Uh, and it's also determined by the fact that we come from a more uh, wealthier family or a less wealthier family. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, uh, I mean, there's people that uh, have seen the value of money when they were young and money was a very hard thing for them to get. Um, so they tend to hoard it as much as possible and uh, they're very, very criterious at the time of spending it, which is fine. But at the end of the day, money is a tool, much like work. And if you do not deploy enough work when doing a task, or if you do not deploy enough money when you're doing a task, then maybe it's not right to expect that task to be done at the end of the day. So if you do not put enough eggs into the pan, uh, it's highly improbable that you will have a decent omelet at the end. Uh, on the other hand, if you've grown up uh, in an environment where money abounds and if you basically uh, don't care about it and if you throw, you're used to throwing money at everything, um, if you use too much money, then you're not being efficient. So there's a balance for this, but at the end of the day, uh, you do need the money much in the same way as you need work or any other ingredient in your secret omelet, so, so to speak. And, and the other question that's highly interesting is, what is the money for? So is it for acquiring customers? Is it for us to buy a machine, uh, which we'll, we will then use to build our product? Is it for hiring people? Is it for doing this? Is it for, for doing that? So you need to have a lot of clarity in terms of what you're going to use the money for. 
um, maybe it's not a good idea to go out and buy BMWs or a water fountain to put uh, right at the entrance of your uh, luxurious office if you do not have a business yet. But on the other hand, a good usage of money could be, for example, hiring a person which is an expert in a certain field or buying that machine that will allow you to take in an input, which is a product, you put it through the machine, uh, and you create an output, which you will sell for a profit margin uh, at the end of the day. So that, that is a good use of, uh, of money. Then the other thing is, do you know what you are doing? And there's there's an example that I like to use here, uh, and we need to be uh, very, very honest with ourselves. One business that I would never have is a restaurant. And I go to restaurants almost every day, but and I've been doing this for years and years and decades on end, but I would never have a restaurant. I have no idea on what is the mystery behind sitting down uh, at a table. Uh, somebody brings over a piece of paper, you point to them uh, what sort of dish you want, and then 20 minutes later or 15 minutes later, there's something in front of you that you can eat. And most of the time it's okay. Sometimes it's not exquisite or excellent, but most of the time it's, it's, it's good food. It's a complete mystery to me. So I would never in my life own a restaurant. I have no idea what sort of magic goes on behind it that allows them to cook in 15 or 20 minutes complicated dishes. I have no idea what it takes in terms of preparing uh, things, how to buy the ingredients, uh, if this meat is better than the other meat, or the, if this fish is fresher than the other fish, or, or whatever it is. So please be really honest with yourselves in terms of, do you really know what you're doing. Is this a business that you feel comfortable with and you know what's inside it, how it works, uh, how people work, where you should get the people from, uh, how do you get the customers in, how do you get the customers out? Let's let's stick with, with the restaurants. For example, in the Nordics, when you book a table at the restaurant, or at least at most restaurants, you book it for an hour and they will throw you out after an hour if you have not finished your meal because they need to rotate the tables and the only way that they can make a profit if they have 50 tables it's maybe to have uh three rotations on every meal which means that they will serve food for about an hour they will see three people uh three consecutive uh cohorts of people at, at that table and uh, and that's it okay so if you do not know this business, if you do not know how it works, then you have two options. Stay away from it, run away from it as fast as you can, or go and study more uh, what's behind it and what needs to happen and how does it work and how you can make it work. Okay. So the, the other thing is, are you comfortable with numbers and math and especially business math, which is not very difficult, uh, but you need to be aware that this is a part of every business. Uh, if you're not familiar or like it, get somebody that does. Uh, and, and the math here is your friends. It's the, the math that will tell you where you're going, if you're going well, if you're not going well, if you will have a hole at the end of the month, uh, if you'll be able to pay salaries, if you're going to have uh, a lot of money at the end of the month, which is also another possibility, although less probable, at least in the beginning. But you need to run the math because most decisions are not emotional, are very down to earth and taken in terms of money. Okay. Is this profitable? Yes or no? Should we serve another type of sauce? Yes or no? Uh, how much does it cost to make that extra sauce? Are people going to ask for it? The fact that we need to have it available, does it cost us a lot? Does it cost us a little? Uh, I mean, it's, it's all very nice questions that you need to think about. There is no other alternative than looking at things in terms of math and numbers running the figuring and understanding if it's a good idea uh, or not as much. 
So the other thing that's really important is your business's overheads or the cost of doing business, okay? In some countries, uh, or in most countries, I should say, and again, let's go back to the restaurant example, you need permits. Permits cost money, and above all, they cost time. And they need to be renewed, and you need to have licenses, and you need to deal with city hall, you need to do this, you need to do that. So opening a business is not just, okay, I'll focus on my own thing and that's done. No, it's not. There's probably regulation, there's laws, there's accounting, there's a whole lot of things that you need to pay attention to, which, by the way, could kill your business. Uh, if, for example, you want to have a telco cell phone provider, you need a license. That license costs a lot of money. So please make sure that if you want to go down that path, you have enough money to buy the license because you will not be able to serve your customers before you have the license. And this applies to a lot smaller businesses that need licenses or permits. Okay. Uh, there's again, there's overheads in terms of accounting. There's all sorts of things. And you need to be aware of this because it's highly traumatic to find in the middle of settling a new business and after spending a lot of money that suddenly you need to have a permit or there's a certain cost uh, that you had not accounted for that kills your business plan and then you don't have a business anymore. One particular instance of this is called cash flow. Uh, and the cash flow is the money, basically, I'm not going to go academic on the definitions, but it's basically the money that you hold in your hands at a certain point in time, okay? So you invoice customers, uh, they will pay you right then and right there or not, depending on what type of business you have and what type of uh, payments terms you have agreed with them. And you also have bills to pay to your suppliers. So you need to make sure at every single point in time that you have enough money in your hands or in your register or in your bank account or whatever it is that allows you to pay the bills and then you that you manage this inflow and outflow of cash very very well so that you do not run out of money because if you run out of money then the thing stops and there's only two ways that it can end either you go and borrow money while your customers pay you if you find somebody that can borrow the money, like a bank or whoever it is, or you close. There's, there's no other option. If you run out of money, you're done, unless somebody lends you the money. And there's something called cost of money, uh, which means that you will pay interest. So it's very, very important. It's not enough to say, oh, I have half a million euros outstanding uh, from uh, my customers, and I owe 200k to my suppliers. If you cannot pay your suppliers, and if they, they run out of patience, and they demand that you pay their invoices, you will need to get the money, no matter what people owe you money, or whatever your customers owe you money. So it's really important to, to understand that. Much in the same way, if you, want to, if you have a payroll, and you want to pay people at the right day of the month you need to have the money in your hand in order to do that regardless of if your customers owe you money or not so the cash flow is actually this game that you keep on accounting for who owes you and when they're going to pay and you compare it to your commitments in terms of paying your suppliers and your employees and all these people. And you make sure that this balance is positive so that you can always fulfill your commitments and your obligations. Okay. One other thing is to understand how the tax system works wherever you're based. So... For example, in Portugal, if you charge VAT on an invoice, you need to deliver 
the VAT that you've collected back to the tax authority. It does not matter if your, if your customer has already paid the invoice or not. If they have not paid the invoice, then you will need to front the VAT money to the tax authority. So you're actually lending money to your customers that have not paid you yet. So if you have a 23% VAT tax like you do in Portugal, it's not very different than what goes on in the rest of Europe. What happens, it's very simple. Uh, for each invoice that your customers do not pay you one time, you will need to deliver to your local tax authority 20 something percent of that invoice, regardless of you, if you have received the money or not done. So that means, and that ties with the previous point about the cash flow, uh, what this basically means is that you need to have at least 23% more money than what you should in order to make sure that you can fill in your obligations with the tax authority, and then you can go and collect the money from your customers if they end up paying you because that's also another possibility is that they default on the invoices and then you're left with nothing and you had to pay the tax authority. And then you go into a process where it takes quite some time to revert the situation back. But nevertheless, tax and cash flow are really, really important when you financially design your business, no matter what type of business it is. Um, the two last points are also very relevant, which is uh, how sensitive is your business to things that happen? Uh, so today, everything is fine. Uh, the sun is shining. We have a certain uh, status quo in terms of business. And then suddenly tomorrow, the price of gas doubles. Can your business sustain that type of impact? Yes or no? What if suddenly half of your customers leave? What if suddenly you get two times more customers than what you thought you would? Are you able to fulfill that demand from your customers? What if tomorrow you cannot access uh, the products that you need in order to create your own products? So it's, it's really, really important once you've completed your figuring to run the sensitivity analysis and make sure that, okay, maybe if I don't grow as fast as I wanted to grow, maybe if I sell half of what I thought that I would sell, how does this affect my business? Can I still pay my, my employees at the end of the month? Is this enough to keep on going? Yes or no? So you need to build a certain type of resilience and reliability into your own business in order to make sure that uh, you, the, the whole thing does not collapse just because there's a little bit of wind uh, out there. So it's really, really important that you look at it through a critical uh, set of angle or, or eyes uh, and say, okay, fine. This is what I think it's going to happen. How probable is it, this scenario? And what if something else happens and I run out of money, I run out of this, I cannot sell for two months, something happens, whatever. So these are the what if scenarios that will give you the resilience and the ability to go on top of things and turn them around and survive uh, and actually uh, make a business uh, out of it. So this is, this is the, the initial points that I wanted to make uh, in terms of um, preliminary uh, observations to the thing. Um, is there any comments? Feel free to unmute yourselves or interact in, in the chat if, uh, if you will. Uh, if not, let's dive into the Excel. I'll just hold on for, for a second. Okay, everything is clear. Mm. I'm not sure if I should believe in that, but 
let's um let's see so here it is and now it's it's my turn to explain this whole thing so this business was a services business so we were basically selling uh services and expertise to to customers back then and we had to put together this five-year operational plan out of which i'm just showing you uh the first three years i mean the second two are more of the same uh it it doesn't matter uh but you'll be able to get the the, the mechanics out of it so there's basically two phases to it there's the ramp up and there's the growth phase the ramp up it's the tricky one okay so it's when you start from zero uh where there's nothing done uh the scaling part you're building on top of something that already exists uh, and this tends to be a little bit easier or at least the challenges are a little bit different okay so what what you can see here i'll put this a little bit bigger so maybe it's more comfortable for you so we what, don't what, see we don't see anything you don't see anything no no you need to share but it's shared. No. No, it isn't? No. Okay. How about now? Now it's okay. And uh, all the others PowerPoints, Pedro, we haven't seen. <laughs> okay. Ah. Sorry. Okay, so I'll 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 run through it very quickly. So yeah. this this was the first one. This was the second one. This was the agenda. These were the questions that I've been talking about, and you have not told me, which means that I need to make a better job at this. But this is this is the nice one. This is the one that um, you uh, you actually need to see to to understand. So again, services business. There's the ramp up phase and the scaling phase so what did we end up putting here headcount headcount is incredibly important because it determines your payroll uh, at the end of the day the revenue which is what you are selling to your customers the expenses which are your costs at the end of the day and here we basically considered a couple of items this is different depending on the type of business so uh, we consider the sales financial costs a labor cost traveling costs and operating costs okay like rents and offices and and things like that if you are selling products then you would have here machinery and all sorts of things and that you would need um, uh, in order to to make your product these were people that were consultants and they were traveling around and they would they were consulting for for customers out of these customers we would get revenues and we would have a certain cost which was basically traveling back and forth rents and the money that we ended up paying people as uh, as salaries that's uh, that's basically what it is revenue minus the expenses uh, will give you at least in a gross format what is called a bid done okay uh, and this is not supposed to be an economics uh, webinar uh, you, you can look at it like this but there's other stuff uh, that enters these types of concepts but let's just make it like this for uh, to make it simple so it's like it's your profit uh what you charge your customers minus what you spend this this is what you get and then there's the cash flow and we had to consider that we would invoice customers on a certain day and they would only pay 30 days ahead so that basically means that we needed to have enough cash flow to finance our customers for 30 days okay so we would need to have enough money in our hand to make sure that we could operate for 30 days while we got the payments in the bank from our customers 
one day that the customers delayed the payments would mean taking money out of our cash flow if we had it. So that would mean basically that uh, we would need to finance the operation. Okay. So what, what you can see here, the first thing is that we have a headcount. And in this first year, we ended up saying that we would have a headcount of 12 people at the end of the year. Okay. In December, you can see here 12 people. And we would start in May with half a headcount or half a person or a person in part-time, if you will. In June, we would have one person. In July, we would have that very same person. In August, we would have that very same person. In September, we would go up and hire three more and get up to four. And then in October, we would hire up two more and go up to six and then three more. Uh, and go up to nine and three more and go up to 12 in, uh, in December. So basically what this determines is our sales. So basically what we were saying is that we're going to start and we're going to take one, two, three, four months, more or less, uh, in terms of sales cycle to sell something to our customers, to sell our services. And then we need to get people that will need to do the delivery uh, of the services. And this means uh, that there's here a challenge in terms of hiring three people in September, hiring two people in October, hiring three in November, and hiring three more in December, which means that this needs to be prepared, okay? Uh, you cannot uh, complete the hiring process in one month, usually. You need to start talking to people, uh, reach an agreement, make sure that they exit their previous job, that they're available to start and all of that. And then they also have a ramp up period. Now the headcount also determines our labor cost, as, as you can see here. And then it starts to, to go up, okay? Uh, so this is not incredibly hard. One person in this case costed us 8,000 euros, more or less 8,000 euros uh, every month. So we have half a person in May, that means 4,000 euros. One person in June, 8K, 8K, 8K. And then when we put in three people in September, it jumps from 8 to 26K. So what we had here was an average cost of the people that we were hiring. And this basically meant that our costs were going up. And when we reached the end of the month, we had a payroll of around 50,000 euros, which is already relevant. It can give you a little bit of a, a nightmare if, if you do not control uh, your, uh, your money and, uh, and your cash flow right. At the same time, we have realized that we would need to sell in September, so a couple of months after we had started, 14,000 euros, and then we would need to sell in October 24,000 euros and 49,000 euros in November and 70,000 euros uh, in, in December. So that's that's how our revenue should go up in terms of the accounting and the figuring that we've done. So we have the labor cost, which is by far uh, one of the things that weighs more in here. And then we have the traveling because these people were delivering services in other countries. And you can see that by December, we should be making 70K. Uh, we would, would be spending pretty much all of it uh, as, as it is, uh, just to finance the current status quo. Now, what happens in the beginning, because we were not selling, we had to finance the operation and the cash flow, which is there because we need to finance, uh, these things was growing, growing, growing. And if you see this last line here, accumulated cash flow, you can see that we needed to have almost 2,000 euros in our hands at the end of December, in spite of having 
a break even in terms of costs and expenses. So uh, in December, we would be doing 1,583 euros of profit if the plan uh, was right uh, and that any adherence to, to reality, okay? But what we had to invest before, we were losing money like crazy almost. We started the first month by losing uh, almost 14,000 euros and then 16,000 euros and so on and so forth. So the, all of this accum accumulates and we were actually paying to work in the first six or seven months of the year and we would have 184,000 euros. We would be down 184,000 euros when we got to December. Okay, so what happens, what would happen in the following year, 2020? Uh, we would reach the end of the year with 12 people in 2019, that's fine. And then you can see here 12 people, 12 people, 12 people, 12 people throughout the first half of the year. And we would jump to 16 people, so four more by June. 2020. So not a lot of hiring and we would reach the end of the first year with 21 people. So that's almost twice what we had in December of the first year. Okay. So here we're doing 70k a month. 70k. You can see that we keep on our delivery uh, capacity stable and then suddenly when we jump to 16 people so four more uh, we go up to uh, 98,000 euros okay and this stays on and sort of keeps up to speed with the growth that we're doing so uh, when we go from 16 to 17 you can see that we go up from 98,000 euros to 105,000 euros okay at the same time our expenses which were constant here in the first half of the year, also start to go up as we hire more people. It's natural, we need to pay the salaries and uh, we need to pay the traveling costs for, for these people. So what, what happens in, uh, in January? So here, we're sort of more or less on the waterline we're doing in terms of profit minus uh, 3500 euros here in the in, in the beginning of uh, of the month of, of, of the year and then when we jump to 16 people we start making a profit of around 9500 euros a month okay so this by this time we have had to put into the business 224,000 euros just to support the cash flow or the outflow of cash, if you will, in order to pay for all the expenses. Okay. So by June 2020, we start to make around nine and a half thousand. Uh, euros of profit every month, which is when our cash flow starts to go down. And you can see here that the first month that we do almost 10K of profit here, it also coincides with the peak or the, or the lowest value in terms of cash flow, minus 224K, okay? And because we're using payment terms 30 days so that means that we collect this money the following month we can put in this almost 10k into the negative 224k and it comes down to 214. so by this time and it's a, more than a year after we started we start making decent money and we start covering for all the cash the negative cash cash flow that we had up to this point and it takes us almost a year more you can see here to June 2021 combined with the growth in terms of headcount to make sure that we start 
making money. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I mean, this is very, very optimistic numbers. Uh, I just wanted to answer a question uh, on how do we calculate cash flow. So in this case, it's not incredibly difficult if there aren't any other things here to consider. Uh, what you do is because you receive a month afterwards, if you want to calculate, uh, let's let's pick here May 2020, what you do basically is say, okay, I've invoiced in May 73,562 euros, but this is what I'm going to receive in June 2020. So what's coming into my bank account is what I've invoiced the previous month, which in this case, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, but in terms of expenses, what I have here to pay is, oh no, sorry, uh, I have 73, thousand euros of expenses and I have 70k of cash flow or of, of receivables from this month so it's basically what I've invoiced this month minus the expenses that I have this month uh, so do I have the money to make it happen yes or no if not I need to put in the money okay are there any other questions before we go on to to the next slide by the way uh it is of no use to you if you just copy the template you need to do the figuring yourselves in order to make sure that you understand what is happening and that is correct so don't use a pre-built template or whatever do the the whole excel yourself you will learn a lot more and you will understand uh, how it varies and how sensitive it is to the parameters that you have here. So if there are no questions, I'll just move on to the next. So what, what we did here, this is sort of the conclusions that we took out of the previous slide. Okay. So this chart here says a lot uh, about uh, about the business and it comes straight from this excel here so what you can see here we have the first three years in there then there's two other years but in this case it doesn't have add a lot of value so we have revenue at the end of the first year of 161k 1.1 million at the end of the second year and 2.5 million at the end of the third year so let's go and see if this is true or not. You can see the accumulated here. So at the end, 161K, 1.141, and two and a half here at the end of uh, 2021. So in terms of expenses in the first year, we end up dispersing 271. On the second year, uh, it costs us a million to stay in business and we're sort of beginning to break even. And we, it's the third year that sort of marks the point from where this thing starts to get interesting. EBITDA or profit, if you will, not the same thing, but for the purpose that we want to achieve here, uh, you can sort of uh, intermix the content, the concepts. In the first year, our business costs us 110k to, to run. And we turn start turning a minor profit at the end of the second year. And it's only at the end of the third year that uh, it starts to make sense. Um, from the figuring that we did in terms of five year projection, it would be by the end of 2023, we would be doing 3.2 million in terms of profits. Okay. So basically what it means in terms of accumulated cash flow is that we start with zero. That's how it always starts. We go until minus 250 more or less. And then this business starts to really produce money like this. And 
it also helps because this was a consulting business and because we sort of worked it out in terms of modules and customers we said well we're going to have a couple of projects and each product is project is going to have uh, x amount of people and what we're going to do is replicate this thing throughout uh, and and that's exactly what we're going to do then that means that in the first year we would have one customer uh, or one project at one customer with this typification we would get another project on the second year we would start the third year with two projects and we would have to sell two more so that basically means that we would have six months to sell these two additional ones on the fourth year we would start with four that we had from the year before and we would need to sell three more projects and on the fifth year we would start with seven and we would need to sell three more now if if this was for example a project that each of these projects was at, at a different customer that would mean that we would finish the first five years and we would have 10 customers is this real is this probable uh is this likely well it depends on the type of business that you you're putting together and the type of products that that you are uh, selling uh, is it hard to get customers is 10 customers too much or too little it depends obviously uh, in this case we thought it made sense but this means that we had to get a customer the first year uh, we had to keep one and get an extra one on the second one keep both and get to more on the third one. And this is the sort of reasoning that helped us to understand uh, if uh, this was something uh, decent uh, or interesting or, uh, or not. Uh, so in terms of initial assumptions and sizing, I mean, I've been through, through the thing with a little bit of detail uh, and you can sort of see here expressed uh, in, uh, in a little bit more uh, of a, a bullet list way. So the first sales cycle was four months and it costed us, you can go and see here, the first four months would cost us in terms of expenses, an average of uh, 15K a month. So we, our first customer, uh would cost uh, would cost us sixty thousand euros to acquire that's that's the rationale behind it we would need to sort of pay our customers 60k in order to get them on board uh, then we had the salaries we had the travel expenses and the sales expenses and all of that and then the operating costs to, to maintain the, the whole thing uh, and we could look at this and come up to this rationale and these graphics that you see here because we did the figuring uh, in detail uh, in, in the Excel. The growth assumptions are extremely important, not just from the Excel point of view, because it's easy to come here and say, ah, I don't like this number 182, let's make it 200. Excel is fine, it will take whatever you put in but you need to sort of acid test it with this type of rationale. So that means that I need an extra customer. Uh, is this easy to do? Yes, no, maybe, depends. Uh, can I upsell my existing customers and instead of making an average of 10K per customer, can I do more? Well, it depends as well. Uh, and you can sort of run your sensitivity or what if analysis by asking all of these fantastic questions so all of this is true if we were able for example to hire the people at the rates that we have here and if the costs were aligned meaning that uh, if suddenly uh, work became more expensive then we would turn less of a profit per month which probably means that this whole thing would not come down to what you see here in these numbers. So asking all of these questions, it's extremely important. And it's your business. I mean, you're not asking this for other people. You're asking this for, for yourself and to make sure that you have uh, a decent business.
Uh, any questions uh, before we move on to to the last slide? Uh, so, Bill, <clears throat> just just a question. Um, of course, that uh, always depends from business to business. But um, for small business, micro business, sometimes it's it's very difficult to calculate the cost of customers' uh, clients' acquisition. How can we try to calculate this? Because I think that will be uh, uh, a big problem for the, the small business, the micro business that have lots of clients with small amounts and not big clients. So um, you, you, there's two proxies for that, okay? One is marketing. How much do you want to spend in marketing to get these people to come through your front door? Okay. So how many ads on Google or on Facebook or whatever it is do you need to do before people start buying? That'll give you a proxy. Or eventually, how much time will you spend yourself yes. selling? To your customers Sorry. and if it's if it's two months then it's easy the 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 price uh is your salary for two months mm -hmm. okay so if you cannot determine exactly what happens you can always use these two proxies how much money do i need to uh, to to spend in marketing in order to get these people into my front door or uh how many people do i need to hire and for how long until they start bringing in customers yeah okay so last slide it's sort of the investor's perspective which i think it was nice to to bring it here as well because what you usually end up doing is you ask investors to pay for this cash flow or this dip in cash flow in the beginning. Uh, sometimes people don't have the money. Sometimes people don't want to put in the money themselves because they're already putting in the work. Um, so most of the times what happens is that you go elsewhere to investors in order to finance this initial cash flow in order to run the business uh, like you think it should be run, okay? Sometimes the investor will tell you, what if I give you twice or four times or 10 times as much as uh, you're asking, will you be able to scale this business accordingly? For example, can you bring this very interesting part of the accumulated cash flow uh, instead of happening on uh, year five? Can you bring it into year three? How much would it cost? And then you need to go. Here and they need to start playing and say, okay, so in order for me to make this to happen, I need to hire more people, I need to get more customers, I need to do this, I need to do that. This costs this amount of money, this costs that amount of money. So can I do this? Maybe yes, maybe no. What happens to the accumulated cash flow? Uh, in this case, what we would need would be 224K in order to finance the, the biggest dip uh, in, in terms of cash flow. Okay. Uh, can we do it faster? Can we do it slower? It's, it basically depends. But this is usually uh, why people go out uh, and ask investors to, to throw in uh, the money. And from the outside, uh, what is relevant is sort of answer these questions that are here. Uh, did, did you pass the tests? Uh, so do you understand what are the risks that affect your business? Yes or no? Uh, can you understand what's the sensitivity and resilience of your business? If suddenly you run out of product in order to resell, how does this affect you? What if suddenly you cannot hire any more people? And so on and so on and so forth. So uh, on, on from the investor's point of view, what they will ask you is, okay, so imagine that you're asking me for this 225K. So what will I get in return? Is this an interesting investment for me? Uh, I give you 224K and what do I get at the end of the day? How does it compare to eventually other alternatives that I have, like putting it in a bank and receiving an interest rate out of it? 
Uh, so this is what's usually on an investor's mind uh, when looking at the project. What is my return? What's, what's in it for me? And, and that's it from my side. I mean, uh, I have no other questions or comments. The, the floor is yours. Anything that you would like to ask, please go straight ahead. So I have another question uh, because when it, when we think in this small business, this micro business, how uh, and thinking in um, the crisis of COVID and the world and things like that, how can we put in a financial plan a safeguard for external factors if we don't know these external? It's important to. In, to put there, how can we do it? Short answer, you can't. Okay, <laughs> so you, 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 I mean, you could plan for an alien invasion if you want, but the probability of something like that happening, it's not very big. By the way, the probability of a pandemic was not very big as well. Okay, so sometimes things happen and there's, there's no way around it. On the other hand, you can tweak and you can plan for other more probable uh, types of things. So price of gas, for example. Uh, do you think it will go down to less than a euro per liter? I don't think so. Should it go up? Probably. By how much? I mean, use 25%, 30%, 100%, up to you. You're the one that's running the sensitivity analysis, okay? So you, you can come up with a, the typical thing is to come up with three scenarios. Like this is a very positive scenario. Everything goes well and all is rosy and we will sell like hell. This is a very negative scenar scenario. Alien invasion and grasshoppers and things all over the place and zombie attack and this and that. And then probably the reality is something in the middle. Uh, so, uh, but the, the short answer is it's the one that you feel comfortable with. Thank you, Pedro. So I don't know if uh, any participants wants, Luisa, you are with us. With Yes, I've been following. I found it very interesting, absolutely. I think it's very useful and um, the only thing I was considering useful and uh, necessary to do I, and I was really following with a lot of interest and I was thinking that um, most of the time the most difficult part for, for our uh, target group is to imagine um, that they are very good in imagining the costs, uh, the expenditures, but not as much as imagining how much they are going to uh invoice their clients or how much their their revenue is going to be so that's a very difficult exercise and i liked your answer to start considering what they intend to earn in terms of uh, wage if they consider themselves as a as an employee and also measure time and marketing expenses that that's interesting but i really think that's the very difficult part because they feel that and and that's probably the weak the weakness of uh, the projects when they do not really know very well who their clients are and what are their opportunities and real potential in terms of selling. So I think that's an exercise there in which we really have to support them. And I believe this is what you probably do as, a, as an investor, try to understand if that part of the exercise is done correctly. Do you know what's the short answer for getting around that? Yeah, tell me. <laughs> try it, because in, incredibly, most people do not try to sell things uh, until they think, okay, so I'm ready to start, I'm going to go and sell. And usually it goes wrong. Yeah. Because, uh, ah, this is too expensive, No, nobody will buy this from me, from me. Uh, or mm, this is not interesting for anybody, it's a wrong value proposition. So if you start before and try to sell it, even if you don't have it, uh, you solve a lot of that problem. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's so interesting because um, 
I, I, when we have people coming in asking for help in starting their business, Pedro, I can tell immediately those who are going to do it and those who are not going to do it. I don't know if that's the same for you, but because uh, mm. those who are going to do it, just do it. And they are incredible. Yeah, but, and then the others talk about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was, I was, um, we had, uh, I have a, I have an example, which is always in my mind. There is this uh, lady coming from, uh, she was coming from South America. I don't remember if it was Colombia or Ecuador. And uh, she, uh, she wanted to do a business in um, jewelry, uh, not jewelry, but you know, uh, she was, she wanted to sell jewels made with tagua, which is a plant from, uh, from South America. And she had lots of problems because she had problems with her permission to stay in Italy. She had problems with, uh, um, she didn't have a salary. So she was struggling with everything. She opened a store and she started producing and she started selling and it was a success. But uh, she was doing it without asking. We, we were supporting, but she was doing before we could tell her. So she was, and I remember that case because she was really an entrepreneur in my, you know, uh, in the real sense of it and she was a success and just do it you're right <laughs> and sell yeah. i thought it was very interesting it's very very interesting and even if it's scary because if you are not um, well acquainted with financial things it's scary but i think it's very you have to stick to it and do it and do yeah. it and do it yeah Thank you very much. That was very nice. So your VAT is 23%. Ooh. Well, our VAT is 22, so it's not far from there, but it's a lot anyway. <laughs> uh, and, and when you say you have to pay, because um, you consider to pay your VAT every month, well, the, then you get into the nitty gritty details. There's okay, a, no, I'm just but, curious. There's a simplified regime where you pay it every three months until you up to a certain level in terms of invoicing. But okay. But on cruising speed and altitudes in a decent business, you're paying monthly. You're paying monthly. Okay. Yeah, it's the same here. Exactly the same. But all the VAT yeah, is European. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the European Union, it's not, not that far apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. That's good. Okay, I, I, I'm fine. I, if you don't have other questions, I think it was absolutely very interesting. Very nice. Congratulations. So, um, I don't know if there are any other questions. The participants normally don't, don't participate <laughs> <laughs> with questions and, uh, and uh, all this, but uh, Pedro is still here. So, if you want to speak with Pedro, uh, you have this opportunity, it's two minutes because we, we need to, um, to close this, this training, all this recording. I want also to, um, to, to explain that the, the recording and all the training materials that are uh, behind this, uh, this uh, online session will be very soon available on the website and also in the learning platform. We have all the, um, the emails of the participants that have made the registration and will send because I, I have uh, I have had today several emails asking uh, a message asking for the the recording and the materials of this session so we'll send all okay as soon as possible we need to make the editing and all these uh, these uh, these questions but very soon we will send it so if you don't have questions, I will thank you very much, Pedro and all participants and Luisa to be here because you are in Italy, but now the Zoom let us <laughs> to be very yeah. close. And Pedro, Serdaira, thank you very much for the your, you. your knowledge here with us. So okay. see you. Bye. Okay. Thank you.